Um, I was recently reading an essay by Wendell Berry, another Luddite who I love, <laughs> and he was defending his refusal to get a computer to write on, uh, asking the question, why in the world should I improve something, which is perfectly adequate how it is. Why would I want a computer when I can take my, the back of my envelope and my pen out into the woods and be like throw and have everything with me that I need instead of all the accoutrements necessary for a computer? And that's a fine question, really, to ask. Does, does the community that we already have without blogs need improvement? Does the blogging community need improvement? And will blogging help or hurt the communities we had before we started to blog? I have to ask myself what my personal investment in those questions are, um, because sort of my central concern in my life is community. I'm obsessed with it. So to answer that question, does will blogging improve community? Uh, I think uh, it's pretty obvious the answer has to be both yes and no, there's sort of, for the sake of time, um, two models I want to talk about. Blogging in the blogger knackle, the particularly Mormon corner of the internet, it can function the way I hope that it functions. And I, I spoke about this in the um, lovely women's issue of Sunstone, where for some reason they elected to interview me. And uh, I'm just going to read the paragraph where I shared my little idealistic diatribe. We at Feminist Mormon Housewives get emails and comments, not infrequently, from people just thanking us and saying, I never knew there was a place where I could safely talk about my doubts without having people assume that my doubts negate what I believe or what I hope to believe. And the more open they can become, even if it's anonymously online, the more open they'll be able to become in their wards. And the more open a ward becomes, the more you get true communitas, the more you really get the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more you get people who love each other genuinely rather than for some falsified image. And that is my kind of revolution. I stand by those statements. That is my kind of revolution. And it is a possibility inherent in um, expanding our definition of community. I kind of would call that the ripple effect. If you make a tentative foray anonymously online and slowly you come out of your shell a little more and then people know your pseudonym so that becomes a doppelganger for who you really are and then your doppelganger and your real self kind of converge and then you can just be who you are at church and then everybody will love everyone for who they are and la la la. We will all go to heaven. Um, yeah, I'm a big hippie and I believe that. But that's not the only possibility. The other possibility is that the compartmentalization which Kaimi spoke to so well uh, can start to become a little bit insidious. Some of you might be familiar with a theorist named Foucault. Um, in addition to my hippie self, I also have my unwritten dissertation literary theory reading self, and so I read a lot of this guy. And he talks about how power structures are often maintained um, by offering the people in lower positions in a hierarchy sort of a place to vent so they can blow off steam and they think they have power because look, they blew off some steam and then because the steam is gone, the tea kettle stops screaming and the water stays pretty hot, but it stays on the stove. And that can happen with online communities as well. If they only become places to vent, then instead of becoming increasingly more and more open and more and more authentic, if you will, with the flesh and blood people we encounter in our lives as well as the people we encounter through ones and zeros on the computer, um, that has the possibility for not just compartmentalization but fragmentation and downright dishonesty where we refuse to really encounter our cognitive dissonance because our doppelgangers become almost independent of each other. I have my internet self, I have my church self, they don't talk to each other and I'll go to church and I'll lie about who I am but because I do go to church and that is really part of who I am, if I'm pretending it isn't online, that's a lie too. You, two lies don't really work well together. So uh, Foucault provides me with a little caution. We have the teapot effect as well as the ripple effect. We can become more alienated from each other just as we can become more honest with each other. And naturally both of those happen all the time interchangeably and anyone who realizes it has to decide how they're going to engage that space in, um, and maintain their personal integrity. And I would never argue that the answer to that question needs to be the same for different people. I can only speak to my own experience. Um, another phrase I tend to overuse is liminal space. John Remy can laugh now at me. <laughs> um, uh, online spaces are liminal. We have to decide what we do when we exit them. 
My personal choice is to enter and exit the Blagernacle, ideally the same way I enter and exit every other communal space in my life. I've chosen, like Kaime to be and Heather, to be honest about my um, legal name, my identity. But that comes with risks, which he's also spoken of. I, I remember the few days after my picture appeared in the Salt Lake Tribune, um, holding my baby above my head, and then there was next to the picture of me tossing my kid up in the air, there was something about feminist and faithful, and it was almost like the competing realities we talk about with your church self and your online self. Don't talk about doubts, talk about doubts. Good little Mormon woman, look, she has a baby. Oh, look, she can be a feminist. And the picture in the paper was almost in dialogue, but I was surprised a little bit by the number of people who talked to me about that, um, who were surprised that I would be a feminist because I thought, my heavens, I'm incre increasingly open about that at church. I've never not asked a question. I've never shut up. I'm sure my bishops of the years really wish I would have on occasion shut up. Um, but that openness about my identity online and in my words has exacted a price. Not, not as dramatic one as Heather. Nobody ever marched me to my car with a cardboard box. Um, but there are, you know, there are people at church who, who treat me like I'm slightly kooky <laughs> or maybe volatile or might maybe more contagious, like the blog is a venereal disease. <laughs> We're not sure we want any of your intellectualism here. We know you seem nice. <laughs> but there's also a risk, um, particularly if you're a perma blogger for a blog or someone who writes regularly and, and, and not just a commenter, in being extremely open about your emotions and not just your thoughts and, per and you know, making it clear that emotions and thoughts indeed can't be divorced from each other. And that is that you are sharing yourself with others, but inevitably, and this is a good thing, but inevitably people will share back. And that means a great deal to me. I've made many friends online, deep, close friends, a lot of whom are sitting here. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes the human brain has a threshold of other people's trauma it can contain. <laughs> and those of you who are familiar with my blog, Feminist Mormon Housewives, will know that currently I'm on a sabbatical. Um, for two reasons, unfinished dissertation, angry committee, to illness. Um, the illness is part long ranging, but it, it was exacerbated in part by the fact that I received hundreds of emails from people spilling their stories of trauma with me and begging me to help them. And I want to help them. I believe in community. Oh, Jesus, like testimony meeting. <laughs> I believe in using whatever space I'm given to build bridges between my heart and the hearts of others, but bridges can't bear any weight. And in a natural, natural, there's an artificial term for you right there, natural. In a community that's bounded by geography, you're only going to know a certain number of people. You're only going to have a certain amount of crises you have to withstand at one given point in time. That is not true on the internet. You can get 200 emails in one day from people begging you to tell them how to make it through another hour. And that can be very, very hard. So the question that I'm currently engaged in as a blogger and as a human being is, how do I maintain enough personal strength to help those people without cutting myself off from them so I'm not even there to ask help from in the first place? And I do not have an answer to that question. I hope I do at some point. Maybe like most portions of identity, we figure out the answer only by enacting it, trial and error. But we are at the peril of having the gift that we offer others turned into a tool for the sublimation of their demons. We are also at the peril of having the gift returned. And for a lot of this, that is just as scary as being used deleteriously. I'm grateful that people seem to connect with me. It means a great deal to me. But I don't know how to use that the best way to help me and to help others. And instead of trying to answer that question, I'm just going to leave it with the question. I do not know where we draw the line and still maintain our own strength. Thank you.